Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. I'm 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 going to talk to you today about uh, Perl and FFI and my adventures in this in um, this interesting world that I've discovered. Uh, uh, most of you probably don't know who I am. I'm my name's Graham Wallace. Uh, I've been a Perl programmer for about 20 years, but um, most of the time has been spent on dark pan projects. And two years ago, I I, uh, I joined DCPM and I've started putting some stuff on on CPAN. So I've been more uh, contributory. And uh, uh, I work for Adnet on a NASA contract to provide computing resources to Earth scientists and. Uh, in the team inside my company, we work uh, almost exclusively on Perl. Um, we have our own government-mandated acronyms, the SIPs and the ACPS. Uh, it's a small team, and uh, they see the value in, in Perl and, and YAPSI, so they kindly sent me here to talk to you today. Um, in my spare time, I enjoy connecting things that don't really normally go together, and I happen to be Australian. So my favorite animal is, of course, the platypus, since it is an aquatic mammal that has a duck bill. Uh, it lays eggs, uh, and as I've been reminded recently, is poisonous, as apparently all Australian animals. <coughs> <laughs> and I, um, and I, I, got, I love pearl, actually, more or less for the same reasons. It's kind of a, it's an odd animal that... Sorry? It could be, it could be. Um, so, FFI, what's that? Uh, as it, I have a mic. I don't know if it's. Is the mic. Is the mic not on? I, I, I'm, I'll just have to talk loudly. Can everybody hear what I'm saying? Okay. So, um, so what's FFI? As it turns out, it's a great way to connect things that don't normally go together. Um, According to the uh, libffi project, it's a foreign function interface is the popular name uh, for the interface that allows code written in one language to call code written in another language. And the image that, of course, you're supposed to come to mind is putting a, a duckbill onto an adorable uh, aquatic mammal. In practice, uh, FFI, and I'm going to use this terminology, uh, usually refers to specifically the bindings of to libffi uh, from a scripting or virtual machine platform like uh, Python, Ruby, Java. Uh, and now you can do it from uh, Perl as well. In Perl 5, we already have an FFI, and that's called XS. Uh, the way it works is that you start with some XS code, which is sort of, uh, it's kind of a Frankenstein's monster of C and the C preprocessor uh, and the guts of Perl, uh, which they call an API. And this gets uh, compiled using X sub PP into plain C code, which then gets compiled and linked with other C files optionally and libraries into a dynamic library, which can then be called from Perl using the Dyna loader. So hopefully you're at least somewhat familiar with that. Um, XS is primarily useful for three things, I think, when I was thinking about this. Uh, Firstly, it's useful for creating bindings to existing libraries, usually written in either C or C++, uh, or optimizing parts of your program that need to be especially fast or small. And it's also useful for extending the Perl language itself. So you can add, use it to add keywords. Uh, and the elephant in the room is, of course, that XS is really necessary for most of what's on CPAN, because uh, most of what's on CPAN depends either directly or indirectly on Access modules. Uh, and it has a number of limitations. Uh, it's tied sort of inexorably to the current implementation of Perl 5. Um, I don't think it's especially easy or intuitive to, to learn. Um, there is, take a look at the man pages. I mean, I, I think they've done a, a valiant effort, but it is a tricky subject. It has its own sort of repertoire of what I think is not especially Perl ish terminology. So even coming from a, a strong Perl background, it is uh, challenging to, to, to understand and learn. It also, as I said, uh, uses the C preprocessor a lot, which has a lot of caveats associated with it. Um, 
There is, it is kind of an API, only sort of. Um, its documentation is uh, a little bit spotty in places. Uh, and um, I, I think importantly, uh, the interfaces, the innards change from time to time. And you know, for good reasons, we want to improve the, the, the Perl core. Um, but that is, can be painful for excess authors at the same time. So FFI, on the other hand, has a number of advantages. First of all, no C compiler is required once the FFI extension is installed. I personally think it's a little bit easier to uh, develop for, and I'll be showing some examples of, uh, of, of, uh, that I think demonstrate that. You don't need to know anything about XS or the Perl guts, uh, and so you're also, it's also more resistant to changes. Uh, changes in the, in, the, in the guts of Perl don't affect FFI extensions directly. Um, I think it, I'll show, talk about this a little bit later, but it's potentially much more portable. Uh, the build process for a simple FFI module uh, that just provides providing, just, just provides bindings to an existing uh, system library is much simpler because you don't have to do anything special in the install step, right? You can just grab the uh, dynamic library and call to it directly using, in this case, FFI raw. So I'm going to be focusing on two FFI distributions that I used, uh, but I did not write myself. One of them is FFI raw, and the other is FFI suite. There's also another uh, module, another mature FFI on CPAN called uh, Win32 API. And I don't personally use it because I, I have stuff that needs to work everywhere, not just on Windows. But it does have some advantages over FFI raw and suite. Uh, and I think especially in terms of its Windows-specific features. So if you are working in that area, it's definitely you want to check it out. This is what FFI raw. Oh, there's a typo there. That should be use FFI raw, sorry. <laughs> this is basically what FFI raw looks like. Uh, as you can see, uh, you define a function by giving the name of the library and the name of the function and its return uh, return value and argument types. And um, in this case, I'm, I'm using the standard C library on Linux, and uh, I'm grabbing the put s function, which allows me to print stuff to standard output. So a lot simpler, I think, than the, what the equivalent XS, well, this is right in your Perl code. You wouldn't, don't even need a separate uh, file to, to implement it. The author of FFI raw accepted a patch from me which allows you to use undef as the library name in order to search the current process for symbols. So, and this is handy because libc is called something on just about every platform, even Unix, it's not called the same thing. So, so um, that's, that was cool. Uh, $put s here is an FFI raw object, but it can also be used like a code reference thanks to overloading. Um, it's still an object, so there are some places where you can't use it as a code reference, uh, depending on how it's used. So you just be aware and use with caution. Um, of the FFI interfaces that I'm going to show you today, this is the uh, most mature, uh, and it can be used to write CPAN modules today because it, it works in, on, most, on almost all the platforms that you'd want it to. What's the int there? Sorry, the int? Uh, the return value. So, yeah, I guess to be explicit, so the first argument is the library, the second argument is the name, the uh, third argument is the return type, and then all the rest are the argument types. So in this case, I just have one, but you could have as many as you wanted. Are there any other confusing things? Um, so FFI Suite is a Ruby FFI-inspired interface. Um, that is built over FFI raw. And this, it has the same capabilities, but instead of working with an object, you get a, a real code reference installed into your package for you. So it's, it looks a little bit more like um, a regular Perl interface. Uh, it's not on CPAN at the moment, but I'm hoping uh, we can get there soon.
There are other a couple other FFI, <coughs> excuse me, FFI projects out there to be aware of, uh, or maybe be aware of. Uh, one is C types, which I think it showed some promise at some point, but I don't think it's being actively developed, uh, and it's certainly not on CPAN, so it's not useful today to write modules on, on um, CPAN like FFI raw is. Not on CPAN. So FFI no suffix uh, uses FFI, FF call instead of lib FFI. It's not maintained, and neither is uh, FFI call, and also it's uh, GPL, so it may not be a license that you're looking for. Um, so I wanted to write something real using FFI raw and Perl. Uh, to see if I could find holes in the implementation uh, and to come up with ideas that might improve it. I picked libarchive, which turned out to be a pretty good uh, library to target, as it turned out, for a lot of reasons, most of which I wasn't aware of going in. Uh, basically, though, it's similar. It's the TAR implementation for FreeBSD, and it has like a, no a number of uh, pretty cool features. Uh, it will detect, read, and write most uh, popular formats automatically, and it handles all kinds of compression. It's a, it's a pretty neat library. Uh, what's interesting in the context of FFI, of course, is that it's implemented in C, so we can use FFI or XS to write bindings for it. It's also object-oriented, so it sort of lends itself well to a, a scripting language like Perl. Uh, here's a, a short program to give you an idea of what I mean. This program opens an archive uh, of any formats that's supported by libarchive, and it prints the members to standard output. Uh, and um, it's object-oriented in the sense that it makes the use of opaque pointers. The constructors are C functions that return the opaque pointer, and then you can pass that pointer back in as the first argument to functions which are, in fact, basically method calls. Uh, Does that make sense? Um, so I wrote archive libarchive FFI, this is my Perl distribution on CPAN, uh, to be comprehensive so that it shows that FFI raw can be used to implement a, a large API. And um, libarchive has, I, I can't remember, it's like three or 400 functions, so it's a, a, a lot. And I only sort of punted on the last like four or five and I decided they were either um, not really, didn't make sense in Perl or were just too much work. So it was a, it's fairly comprehensive. It's built using FFI raw and FFI suite. Um, LibArchive and my bindings provide a customized IO interface. You can give it functions to perform uh, the actual IO. So say you want to write directly to a network or um, a database instead of a, a file. You can do that using this interface. And this was useful because it exercised the part of FFI raw that allows you to create a closure and call back into Perl code from C. <coughs> uh, my bindings also provide the, all the latest functions in, in libarchive. Uh, so then each version seems to provide new features and at the same time as uh, supporting fewer features if you're using an older version of libarchive, your system comes with an older version. The vast majority of the functions provided by archive libarchive FFI are defined in this way. And it's a simple uh, declarations to attach the functions. So this creates the uh, subrefs that you can, uh, basically just subroutines in, in the archive libarchive FFI namespace. And here I'm using uh, a wrapper around um, attach function called underscore attach function because FFI suite usually uh, throws an exception if the symbol isn't found. And as I said, I didn't want, I wanted to support everything was there but not die if there was stuff missing. <coughs> so. Uh, a number of libarchive functions take uh, buffers as arguments, so either as input or output. Um, a buffer is just a pointer to a region of memory and uh, a size for that region. The C version of this function, archive read data, for example, takes an archive object as its first argument, followed by a pointer and a size pair, which defines the buffer. Uh, I wrote the Perl version instead to take an archive object as the first argument 
and a scalar uh, where the data was to be written to as the second argument. So it's, it's the obvious thing that makes sense you know, in Perl land. FFI suite provides this wrapper interface. So the, so the um, first argument is the, the code reference to the real uh, C function. And, and this function gets called you know, in between so that it looks normal, looks like a regular uh, Perl function. So uh, here I'm creating a callback. So this is, uh, I'm using FFI. So this, is, this allows you to call, um, call back into Perl space from the C code. Uh, and I'm using FFI raw in this case because Suite doesn't provide the interface yet. Uh, this uses, again, a similar sort of wrapper pattern where um, uh, instead of, uh, it, it translates a C buffer into a scalar. And this is the function that allows you to install that callback. And again, it uses the regular attach function uh, method and a wrapper around it in order to uh, sort of get everything to work. So to go back to the original uh, libarchive example that I showed you, here is the Perl version. And it should look, it looks almost, this, it looks very similar. Uh, and it does kind of the same thing, exactly. And here is a slightly different one um, that uses the callback interface. So in this case, I'm just, I am still just reading from a file, but you could stick whatever you wanted in there. It could be, you know, you could write, you could read from a database or from the network or anything you could come up with. <coughs> so integers are mostly, integers and pointers is mostly what I've showed you so far, and they're pretty simple, but what about structures? Uh, LibArchive uses mostly opaque pointers, as I mentioned. Uh, in a couple places, though, it does reuse system structures in order to communicate with the calling library, <coughs> calling code. Like this uh, archive entry stat function, uh, it works just like the system stat, except for instead of returning statistics on a file in the file system, it returns statistics on a file in archive member. So you might be wondering, like, how I implemented that. Anybody got any ideas? No? Subjects? Sorry? Move subjects? So, no, I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? You didn't? I, no, I cheated. Same yeah, exactly. So uh, I cheated. I, I, so LibArchive provides you an interface to all those statistics members separately. So I call them one at a time. I group them up as a list, and I send them back. Uh, so now I have, um, you know, it, it involves more uh, calls into C, but I have a, a uh, archive entry stat function that works just like the built-in Perl stat, except for instead of uh, operating on a file in the file system, it returns the statistics of, of a member of the archive. Uh, but you can interface with structs uh, using FFI. And here's some example C code that comes with FFI raw. Uh, we have a struct with an integer and a string and a function uh, that prints the string if the integer is 42. Um, it's not the most brilliant algorithm, but it'll show the example. You can use the built Perl built-in pack function to create uh, a pointer object that can then be passed into any FFI function that takes a pointer. I'm not especially crazy about this interface. Uh, First of all, you have to create um, you know, another scalar in order to just pass it in. And, and another thing is that um, uh, pack and unpack are complicated beasts, which are, can be very useful. But they're also, like I say, they, they can be uh, difficult and error prone for the unawares. <clears throat> this is kind of what they do in, in Ruby land. Um, you define a class that, define, that uh, derives from FFI struct. Then you give it a layout. Um, and then you can use it just like a regular Ruby object. You can assign values to it. You can get values from it. Uh, but when you pass it into an FFI function, it uh, will understand what to do. You treat it as a pointer and pass it to the C code. Uh, if you've used inline struct before, uh, you might see some similarities. And I actually. I th been meaning to check this out, but I, I think it'd be an interesting experiment to get inline struct to work with FFI raw. Uh, so an exercise for the 
those that are interested. Uh, back to our particular example, though. Um, oh, I, one thing I wanted to mention, this is the direction that uh, we're thinking about going with FFI Suite, but it's just an idea, uh, not an actual implementation yet. Uh, our particular problem, though, uh, the stat structure is not that easy to implement using either of these two methods. Uh, have you ever seen the Linux version of stat? Uh, it's a little bit crazy. Uh, this is just one implementation. Uh, and now imagine you have to support BSD, Solaris, HPUX, or what have you. Yeah. It's not fun. Uh, this, this is the reason why I punted, if you're wondering. Um, I decided that I didn't. Uh, one possible solution that I came up with is to define, to create your own interface to a C structure uh, from C, uh, and then call the interface from Perl using FFI. Uh, for example, here's a, a partial implementation of STAT using an opaque pointer object system, similar to what uh, LibArchive uses for its objects. So it, this was kind of inspired for, by what I'd already, the, how I'd been using LibArchive. Uh, and this is the FFI suite bindings for that interface. And it, it looks very similar to, um, it should look very similar to what uh, I was doing with LibArchive. Um, And this is just uh, an example of, of, of how I used to test it. And so you can see how it's used. So it, it works. It looks just like a, a regular Perl class. You can instantiate it. You can get access members. You know, but it's really kind of C. It's really a, a, the stat structure underneath the hood. And um, the advantage here is that at no point did I have to specify the layout of the stat structure. Uh, because the C compiler handled it for me, kind of at the cost of some complexity during the install step. So in order to, to do this, I wrote a module called uh, module build FFI to make this thing a little bit easier. Basically, uh, you can throw some C code into a folder called FFI inside your distribution and it will build it and make it available for you so that you can uh, call it from your uh, Perl code using FFI raw. And although I'm using this example for creating an interface to uh, a C structure, you could do the same thing uh, to create, to write code, uh, write parts of your program that need to be uh, fast or small or whatever. And you may remember from the beginning, this is one of the things that I said was useful about XS. This is an, just another tool in your tool belt that you can use. So this is the same diagram that I showed you earlier uh, for XS and how it compares. And I just wanted to compare it to the equivalent module build FFI sort of interface. So the installer compiles the C code uh, directly into a DLL or um, SO, a dynamic library. And now you can call it uh, from your Perl code using FFI raw instead of using the Dyna loader. So the second thing that I want to sort of talk about was how you get, how do you get these libraries? I kind of feel as though you ought to be able to use uh, something like this library that I've written, archive, lib archive, FFI, without in, um, but by simply just installing it from CPAN, uh, without having to read the documentation really closely uh, to find out all the different libraries that you need to install. Or maybe you have to download the source code to something and put it into an adjacent folder. Or uh, maybe there's an environment variable you need to set somewhere or something like that. I think this should, stuff should just like kind of work out of CPAN. Um, otherwise, you know, your library is not going to be used as a prerequisite for anything because people are going to be worried about all the hoops that your, their users have to jump through. So this sounds like a job for an alien module, right? 
So Alien is this thing. It was invented back in uh, 2003, I guess. So it's not a new concept or idea uh, by Archer Bergman. Uh, and it's basically a documentation only uh, .pm file, so a sort of statement to the world, which says that the alien namespace should be used to define CPAN prerequisites for things that are not native to CPAN. Uh, so like C libraries, like things like libarchive, basically. And the idea being that you um, install alien foo, uh, and then as part of its uh, installation, it either finds the system library, the system lib foo for you, if it happens to be installed, or if it's not, download the source code for it, build it, and then uh, make it available to uh, you know, later CPAN modules like uh, Foo XS or Foo FFI. So the main problem with Alien, I think, is that uh, there wasn't any sort of framework or standard or really even any common sense suggestions about how they should be implemented. Um, so each one kind of has its own quirks and uh, its own style, which is it's good. We should, all, we should all try different things, and but then choose the ones that are good. So Alien Base was supposed to address some of this. Uh, it's kind of a generic implementation of Alien that you can use as a base class for creating Alien modules. And my first implementation of Alien Lib Archive, which is what I use to, uh, which what Alien, sorry, what Archive Lib Archive FFI uses to find the Lib Archive library. So my first implementation was built using Alien Base, and uh, basically the architecture is split into two parts. Uh, there's a build.pl file uh, that uses module build subclass called Alien Base module build. Uh, and it's really good at kind of one thing, which is building uh, or finding and, build and or building uh, GNU style packages that provide a, a package config.pc file. Uh, and the second part is an alien base subclass that gives the calling module or calling code the C flags and the libs that it needs uh, to compile and link against. Um, and this was like a huge improvement from like what was there before. But uh, unfortunately, I had, a, uh, had to do a lot of subclassing in order to get this to work, uh, in order to work around some of the, let's call them features of Alien Base. Um, so in, um, I recently rewrote it using a slightly different architecture and removing the uh, Alien Base prerequisite. Because I also kind of feel like um, the, some of the problems with Alien Base are sort of architectural. So the alternative that I came up with was to extract uh, the library sort of detection and um, building logic from the, um, from the module build class so that it could be used in other contexts. The other departure that I, I, I made in, from the older version of Alien Lib Archive was that I provided uh, an explicit interface for finding the dynamic libraries. So Alien Base was really designed to make XS modules and I sort of said, well, I can kind of use that for FFI, but this was sort of like specifically provides that capability for me. Um, so the older version kind of does something weird with DynaLoader that it uses to find libraries, and that works most of the time, but I discovered there were some corner cases. So just having an explicit interface that does exactly this one thing for me was great. So. Now I have this different architecture where I have uh, two distributions. I have an installer and the alien, uh, alien lib archive. Um, and there are two, in addition to the FFI modules that I've written, there's, there are two um, XS modules actually that use alien lib archive. One is uh, archive lib archive XS, uh, which provides more or less the same interface as archive lib archive FFI, except for it uses XS. So it might seem a little strange um, that I did that, but to me it was kind of like a useful exercise to see where you know, FFI raw was good and where XS still had some you know, capability that was useful. The other is archive AR lib archive, uh, 
which can be used to read static libraries. It sort of it uses a very minimal set of the capabilities that are in libarchive. Uh, and it actually is used by FFI Suite to find dynamic libraries on Windows. So it's kind of a, a niche case. Um, is there anything else? So, so, um, and then now archive libarchive FFI can use the installer directly to find the system libarchive if it happens to be installed. And if not, uh, at in, as part of the install step, it says, by the way, please install alien libarchive as a prerequisite, and it uses that. You might ask me that why would I do that? Uh, why not just use Libby, uh, the alien libarchive all the time? Well, uh, alien libarchive requires a compiler uh, because it actually tests the library with a compiler to make sure it works. Uh, and, and this way, and alien lib and the installer actually knows enough to be able to test instead of using a compiler with FFI. So it tests exactly what I need to know. <clears throat> um, so, it's, so if you can get away with using the installer, it's lighter weight and it's better. Uh, on, the other t on the other hand, like the uh, excess modules that I wrote, it makes sense for them to use the alien lib archive directly because they're going to need a compiler anyway. So this architecture is kind of, I, this isn't how I'm using it, but this can be handy in, a, in another, other, a, a couple of other ways. So suppose you have a module that requires a specific version of libarchive. So say you need a recent one, like version 3.1. Uh, so what you can do is you can say, uh, first use alien libarchive, use the installer, uh, detect the system, see if it meets your needs. And actually it also, if the user has already installed alien ar libarchive, it'll use that as a, um, as a backup. And otherwise, it will download and install, it'll download and build libarchive that you can then link against. So, and so like I said, you, this you can use for a newer version, or if, say you need a slightly older version, that'll work too. You can also use the detection logic uh, to use libarchive as, a, as an optional prerequisite. So uh, say you have, um, you have a distribution that might use libarchive, but it's not necessary. Um, simply make you know, the installer a prerequisite, and you can see if it's available in the system, or if the user happens to have chosen to install alien libarchive, it'll use that. But it won't ever choke if, if libarchive isn't, isn't there or maybe isn't supported by your platform. The other frustration I had with Alien Base is that it makes uh, dynamic libraries from most of the packages that it builds. Um, so, the, the, so your XS module actually builds a dynamic library, which is then called by the dyna DynaLoader. So if you're using an alien uh, base uh, distribution, if you're using alien base, basically your XS uh, dynamic library is depending on this libfoo.so, which um, is, lives in the, um, the, the alien module's uh, share directory. Uh, this turns out to be really fragile. <coughs> Because if you install a system library, a system version of libfoo, it'll actually break alien, alien foo. Uh, if you upgrade alien foo after installing foo xs, that can also break. Um, and really the solution is to use static libraries to, to build your xs uh, dynamic library, um, but keep the dynamic libraries around for FFI. Um, but when you have both uh, static and dynamic libraries in the same folder, in the same directory, uh, GC uses, GCC uses the dynamic one by the default. And that's, why Alien, that's basically why AlienBase does the same thing. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, so, and, and, and getting the appropriate linker flags to get, to get, it, to get this to work is really tricky. So what I did instead was, um, 
just to move the dynamic libraries into a different folder. So I keep, I keep the SO and the DLL files in, in a directory. I called it DLL, just lack, for lack of a better term. And now the XS modules will simply use the, the uh, static libraries, and I can still grab the dynamic libraries for my FFI modules. Another challenge that I had was uh, the, the autoconf-centric uh, approach was caused me some difficulty. Uh, in Windows, um, basically, you need um, something called msys. It's sort of a minimal GNU system, or minimal kind of Unix GNU. I don't know, whatever. Uh, it, it provides sort of a lightweight shell environment for Windows, enough to run autoconf. Uh, and it's not normally there in Windows. It's not, even there, it's not even part of Strawberry Pearl, so you can't really sort of depend on it. Um, so what I did was I wrote alien msys, which allows you to run configure, um, and it's also a no-op in Unix. So it solved that problem for me. Uh, package config was also an issue. So it's not native or even widely available under Windows. Uh, and in fact, often, if, uh, unless you explicitly install it, it's not available. It's sort of a development package. Uh, which is tricky if you're doing FFI stuff because the, the whole idea of FFI is not to need a compiler. And if you have to d then install the development stuff, it sort of uh, screws things up. So uh, what I did was I actually adopted a, a Perl. There was an existing uh, implementation of package config uh, written in pure Perl. Um, and I, the developer wasn't doing a lot with it, so I kind of adopted it. and. Uh, it was actually a pretty good module. It just needed a few tweaks. It didn't work on Windows yet. It does now. Uh, in fact, now it pretty much works everywhere. At least that's what CPAN testers tells me. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about this as, as a lightning talk tomorrow. So the future, the road ahead. Um, I picked this picture, by the way, because those flying car things kind of reminded me of, yes, a platypus. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, I'm working on my own lib FFI bindings uh, based on my experience implementing archive lib archive FFI. Uh, and why not call it FFI platypus? Uh, some of this is working, but all of it is very much experimental uh, and subject to change. And I don't know, I may not even have time to do it. I don't know, it's just kind of interesting for me, I, some ideas that I'm sort of putting into an actual pr uh, library. Uh, but in addition to the stuff that you can do already with FFI raw, I'd like to make it much simpler to do operations with pointers on with basic types like integers. So, I, and I think that sort of the uh, metaphor for this, or the uh, the conceptual way to do this, is to uh, use references. So, for a function that takes a pointer to an integer in C, you ought to be able to pass a reference to an integer in Perl. And the FFI layer, whatever it is, you know, if it's FFI raw, or if it's platypus, or if it's uh, FFI suite should be able to kind of just rock that and, and handle it for you. The other thing that I think uh, would be really useful is the, 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 the wrapper interface that I showed you that FFI suite uses is really powerful. I mean, I used it a lot when I was implementing archive, lib archive FFI. But I also found that I was repeating myself like a lot. And I think that instead of attaching the wrapper to the function, if you attach it to the type, then you can implement it just once. And then every time you need to pass in that type to a C function, it'll use that particular wrapper that you need. Um, so if you, and if you used XS before, uh, you should be probably thinking about type maps, because it's a, it's a similar idea, basically. Uh, sort of a recipe to translate from Perl to C. So portability was something that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think this is an idea that we can borrow, oh, a good idea that we can borrow from the Ruby folks. Here's a diagram that I borrowed from, uh, or stole from Jeremy Heigardner. Uh, he did a similar talk for the Ruby folks like uh, a number of years ago. Uh, basically, in Ruby, they have multiple implementations, right? There's um, JRuby, which is in Java. There's the original C implementation. There's something called Rubinius. I'm not, a, I'm not a Ruby expert. But basically, the idea is that uh, you can implement your extension, your FFI, in, for one of these uh, particular versions of Ruby. 
but expect them to work in the other ones. And, then, and, and obviously, there are different advantages to using each one. So one of the challenges for a future implementation of Perl, or you know, maybe Perl 6, I don't know, is that large swaths of uh, useful CPAN depend on XS, and they just won't be, they'll need to be rewritten or something equivalent. Um, if each implementation had a standard FFI interface, porting uh, extensions between those different uh, implementations would be a lot easier. And actually, the idea that I have is if, if the interface could be reduced to something, some sort of data structure, like a, uh, something in YAML or JSON maybe, uh, then it would be even easier. Like, so the syntax for Perl 6 is going to be significantly different from Perl 5. So if your interface is defined in some sort of uh, data structure, then you can say, here it is, and it should just work. Maybe. We'll see. So at the beginning of my talk, uh, I showed you the things that I thought that XS was good for. Uh, how does that compare to FFI? Um, I've shown you that you can write bindings for an existing library uh, written in another language. And I, uh, archive, libarchive, FFI is just one example. Um, I've shown you that you can write um, parts of your program using FFI uh, that need to be fast or small. Um, one thing it isn't especially good at is extending the Perl language itself. And I think, obviously, this is an area where XS shines uh, because it is basically the guts of Perl exposed for anybody to tinker with. And I think that's a good thing. I think that actually is something that it is really good for and, and is Go. I don't know. Uh, other things that maybe are challenges or limitations is uh, uh, support for esoteric platforms like, you know, VMS or Plan 9. Um, they're probably never going to work with lib FFI and, and probably not with FFI raw either. I did do uh, quite a bit of work to make sure that FFI raw uh, works on Windows though and SIGWIN. Uh, using both GCC and Visual C++. So uh, you know, not working on Windows is not an excuse that you can use. Um, the other thing that FFI stuff doesn't do is it doesn't catch errors that your C compiler normally would. So something like using the wrong uh, argument types or return types uh, won't flag an error. Uh, but so you kind of just you need to do a lot of checking, uh, testing. But I'm going to, since this is my talk, I'm allowed to classify things as I want. I'm going to give this a check mark because you should be doing testing. CPAN uh, and GitHub. And the author, the uh, maintainer, Alessandro, is very, actually, he's been very good about. Uh, being accessible, um, accepting pull requests that I've made to support weird platforms and, um, and that kind of thing. And he's also actually fixed a couple bugs that I found but weren't, wasn't able to figure out. Um, FFI Suite is this thing. Um, it lives on GitHub at the moment. Hopefully, we can get it moving. Um, and the primary authors are uh, Meredith Howard and myself. Um, I also wrote some, I, I put some RPMs together for recent fedoras um, on OBS if you want to try it out without compiling. I don't know, just a aside. Um, but that's it. Uh, my name's Graham Wallace. Like I said, I am on CPAN and GitHub and Twitter and email. And um, I'm, I'm really interested in this stuff. So if you are too, uh, you know, maybe we can collaborate or if you have suggestions, whatever. Uh, are there any questions? No? Question. How does uh, the performance compare between the FFI interface and Texas? So um, I didn't do any uh, benchmarking, per se. Um, the stuff that, I, that I, I used it for was fast enough for me. It is, so FFI raw itself is written in XS, right? So there is going to be 
so you are going through excess anyway, and it, it's, um, it's, there, there may actually be things that can be improved there actually to make it faster. Um, uh, but so more of the idea is to make these things easier, and then we can work on you know making it faster too, I guess. But like I said, so the um, the archive lib archive FFI. So uh, I actually use we use this at work. We have a, an application that you can download uh, uh, files that the scientists produce in in a tar in, in a tar file. And we used to be using a pure Perl implementation. And I switched to this FFI version, and it was uh, it was noticeably faster. Um, it was about twice as fast, just uh, measuring the, the download speeds. Um, and but the, the nice, the cool thing about it was the old version only supported tar, and, and this version supports like any of the uh, formats that that the archive does. So, yes. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. No, so I didn't, I didn't ex exercise that aspect of it. Anything else? Yes. You also did an excess uh, version of the of the little bar kind of uh, code as well. How do you characterize sort of the ease of, of coding the two? Um. Well, they're both a bit challenging because. Um, I was kind of working on make, improving the uh, FFI interface as I was working on it. So um, I would say that overall, um, I think that as the FFI raw and FFI suite evolve, I think they'll become uh, much easier. I think they're already much easier than they were when I sort of first started working on them. Um, XS is definitely challenging because I would sort of um, Look at the the man pages like the Perl guts and Perl API and sort of just hit my head um, on the table. Um, but so, like I say, I think I think the FFI interface is easier. Um, but uh, then again, there are some things that 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 are, are just because you're in the guts of Perl, you can there are things that you can do that you can't do from FFI. Yes. Yeah. You, uh, so the way it's right, right, the way it's right now, you'd probably have to use the wrapper interface. So you'd, yeah, you'd pack it into um, a C thing and uh, pack it. Use pack, pass it into the the function, and then it would do its thing. And then you would get back uh, the pointer, and you could um, you could unpack it at that point. So I, I, that's something that I, I think that should be a little bit easier, right? I think that like the, the interface that I was talking about using references, like m my example was just a, a reference to an integer, but you could have like a, an array reference that got translated in the FFI layer into, um, like I say, ass 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 assuming you have the, the type is annotated correctly, I think you could do it easier. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Ooh, perfect. <laughs>